In the city of London in 2013, Martin Lindsay parked his Jaguar in the street. About two hours later, he found that the side view mirror, panels, and Jaguar badge had melted. The culprit? A 37-story skyscraper, dubbed the Walkie Talkie Tower, and later on nicknamed the Walkie Scorchy. Sunlight reflecting off of the tower's reflected glass turned into powerful focused rays, strong enough to melt Lindsay's car, cause fires outside of shops, and smolder front doors. It also fried an egg on the street. This is just one negative consequence of the world city's love affair with the glass skyscraper. New York City has over 6,000 high-rise buildings. 284 of those are skyscrapers over 492 feet tall. To put that in perspective, Chicago, the U.S. city with the second most, has just 126. And for the last 75 years, most of those New York City skyscrapers were built with glass facades. They may look like elegant symbols of modernity, but beyond that shimmer is a list of problems that has some leaders proposing bans. All that beauty comes at a price. It wasn't until the introduction of steel during the Industrial Revolution that the first modern skyscrapers were born. The Home Insurance Building in Chicago was the first tall building to be supported by a steel skeleton of vertical columns and horizontal beams. Dubbed the father of the skyscraper, it stood 10 stories high and was covered in light masonry walls. And for the next 70 years or so, most skyscrapers that followed, including the Woolworth, Chrysler, and Empire State buildings, were donned with rock facades. But this doesn't mean glass wasn't on the mind of architects. Throughout the 19th century, many were experimenting with fully glass structures. Designer Joseph Paxton, chief gardener at the Duke of Devonshire's Chatsworth Estate, was the first to design and build the first large-scale glass structure created specifically for use by people, the Crystal Palace. The 990,000 square feet space hosted the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations in 1851 in London. Despite the awe-inspiring aesthetic, the giant glass house faced many challenges, mainly maintaining a cool temperature. Paxton used some cooling methods such as shading, natural ventilation, and eventually removing sections of glass altogether. But despite his efforts, overheating became a major problem over the summer of 1851, with data records showing that the Crystal Palace's indoor temperature was simply too unstable. These incidents forced organizers to temporarily change large sections of glazing several times before it was permanently replaced with canvas curtains that could be opened and closed depending on the sun. But these obstacles didn't deter famous architects, like Mies van der Rohe, from being inspired by the palace and its use of glass. First started, of course, with large, expansive glass being kind of a post-war uh, era accomplishment and achievement to be able to have these massive uh, panes of glass. And I think that moved into a, the desire to have this complete connection between interior and exterior environments, like just have a fluid uh, glazing that allows for people to see everything outside and everything inside. And I think that there was an attraction to that, uh, but ultimately it became a habit. In 1948, construction began on the world's first tower with a glass curtain, the 505-foot United Nations headquarters in New York City. Soon, more glass towers followed, like the 307-foot Lever House and 516-foot Seagram Building. So what changed? AC. Air conditioning enabled the glass skyscraper to become a model for high-rise office developments in cities across the world. It allowed architects to create alternative layouts without having to worry about seating workers near windows and encouraging collaboration and denser construction. As the corporate workforce expanded with the acceleration of computing and office-related jobs, these employees needed new places to work. Glistening skyscrapers were the response to this in densely populated cities. And as a result, glass became a trend, not just for aesthetic appeal, but because it was just easier than building skyscrapers out of other materials. The idea that you could essentially assemble a building like a, uh, an Ikea piece of furniture, taking prefabricated parts and, and putting them together without skilled stone workers from Sicily carve ornaments on it, but you could just like pieces of it could roll out of a factory and you could assemble it together. But that idea was very attractive to builders who wanted to put up, put up buildings quickly and cheaply, and that continues to be true. Glass buildings are popular, not just because of their striking appearance, but for the views they boast and the increased light they let in. 
Research from Cornell University professor Alan Hedge found that the optimal amount of daylight reduces eye strain and headaches of office workers by 84%. But over the years, drawbacks have become more and more apparent. Glass is beneficial environmentally on that front because it helps daylight a building, which cuts down on the amount of energy you need to expend on artificial lighting. That is probably overwhelmed by the fact that almost everybody in those offices is using computers. And so the energy drained from those computers and then the associated servers and everything is a really important aspect of it. So light is one thing, but heat and cooling is another. According to the International Energy Agency, the amount of energy used for cooling has more than doubled since 2000. And it'll double again by 2040 if we don't curb our reliance on air conditioning. You want buildings to ultimately perform like, you know, like the coolers you take to the beach where it's like, you, you know, it doesn't take a lot of ice in there to keep things cool. That's because the enclosure is really uh, performing so well. And so we need to be able to think about materials and building assemblies that allow for buildings to stay extremely uh, consistent in their temperature and not require a significant amount of energy to do that. Glass buildings are not only warming up the world, but they also melted an actual car. To stop this, workers fitted the building with shades to deflect the sun's rays. Architects are championing alternative building materials that can save energy and help a building rely less on HVAC systems. These different facade materials are moving more and more into the mainstream. I'm an architect. I want my work to look good and be photographed and be published. Um, so bricks are like totally out. Bricks are like so yesterday. No one dares build a building out of bricks. The latest kind of popular answer to this whole thing is to build a wood skyscraper. Now, obviously, there's still plenty of glass. So this is taking over because it's it, you can check off all the boxes. It's sexy. It's new. It's sustainable. It looks very cool. And it's probably going to be a little more efficient than glass because it's a solid material that is inherently insulates just by itself. And as new sustainable materials are becoming available, some architects are speaking out on glass usage. Even architects who've built them. Known for his project The Gherkin, British architect Ken Shuttleworth spoke against using the material. I think glass is a symbol for energy guzzling buildings, and we need to move to a much more energy conscious environment to try and save resources. That's, in a way, a manifesto for us as architects, to try and make buildings more energy efficient. Architects in New York are reportedly returning to stone, wood, and copper as alternatives to the glass that has been used to cover the city skyline. Take a look at this pair of copper-clad skyscrapers that were recently constructed by the East River. On Earth Day 2019, Mayor Bill de Blasio introduced his Green New Deal, designed to eliminate new glass-fronted towers from the city skyline. We are going to introduce legislation to ban the glass and steel skyscrapers that have contributed so much to global warming. They have no place in our city or in our earth anymore. We basically said, look, we know that people are going to be using glass in a lot of different ways. We want to say, here's the minimum performance of glass that you can have in a building, you know, no matter where you use it. In addition to several other energy code improvements to make buildings more efficient, we're in the business of saying that we have a high standard that means that buildings need to perform in a way that supports the eight and a half million New Yorkers that live here and not in a way that makes it more difficult for us to achieve our climate goals. As new initiatives are being introduced to tackle climate change, getting rid of glass is just one element of the solution. Glass as a material can be efficient. You just, you just need to be able to utilize it in the way in which it performs the way you need. I've always thought that the notion that we can you know, sculpt and craft the skyline is extremely attractive. And why not allow for that to also incorporate um, a myriad of materials that really do um, showcase that diversity of, of the city that they represent. Architects are arguing that a more restrained approach that sees using glass in conjunction with other materials is the way to go. I think, um, yes, I think this is the moment to think about how to do things in a better way. I wouldn't say we're in love with skyscrapers. I would say there's a lot of understanding right now amongst everybody that glass skyscrapers are not doing us any good. So it's a, it's a moment to say, all right, what comes next? Thanks for watching. Let us know what you think about major cities continuing to build glass skyscrapers. If you like this video, 
make sure to check out our channel and subscribe.